Hey friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Tim Wright, pastor here at Community of Grace Lutheran Church, coming to you from our campus in Peoria, Arizona. So glad to have you with us tonight as we share the story of joy. Uh, years ago, the late Irma Bombeck wrote a column, and it was based on an experience that she had had in church one Sunday, and here's a part of what she said. She said, in church the other Sunday, I was intent on a small child who was turning around smiling at everyone. He wasn't gurgling, spitting, humming, kicking, tearing the hymnals, or rummaging through his mother's handbag. He was just smiling. Finally, his mother jerked him about in a, and said in a stage whisper that could be heard in a little theater off Broadway, stop that grinning. You're in church. And with that, she gave him a belt and as the tears rolled down his cheeks added, that's better, and returned to her prayers. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, found that the journey from atheism to Christianity was a rather tough one. And part of the challenge for him among many was his fear that he had to commit to a life of joylessness in order to become a follower of Jesus. Now the signs of a joyless dour, angry Christianity are all around us. From street preachers warning people that they're going to hell to churches condemning and shaming people for not living up to their moral codes to preachers and politicians warning us of God's wrath if we don't get our act together to everyday Christians venting anger and hatred and outrage in the name of Jesus on social media posts. Now, the world that I grew up in, the Christian world that I grew up in, wasn't devoid of joy by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a bit wary of it. And so we had a number of rules when I was growing up to protect us from the wrong kinds of joy. For example, don't dance, because dancing is a vertical, vertical expression of a horizontal idea. Secondly, don't play cards. And in my case, don't date girls who do. And then there was that big shame-based question that your parents would ask. Do you really want to be caught in that movie theater watching that movie should Jesus come back at that very moment? You see, somewhere along the line, at least from the perspective of many non-Christians and Christians, Christianity has become this dour, joyless, angry religion that has very little to do with the founder of that religion, Jesus. You see, one of the accusations made against Jesus that stuck and that concerned the religious leaders of the day was that Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard, that essentially he was a party animal. Now, Jesus was not a drunkard, and he was not a glutton. But he didn't do himself any favors because sometimes he would throw fuel onto that flame of an accusation because Jesus was a man who enjoyed joy. For example, in John chapter 2, John tells us that the very first miracle of Jesus took place at a party. He and his disciples, along with Jesus' mother Mary, had been invited to a wedding in Cana. Now, Cana was a small village up in northern Israel in the Galilee area. And as was true of all little villages at that time, these people lived on the edge of poverty. Life was hard. And so if there was a wedding in the community, it was a chance for them to spend a week in joy, festivity, and celebration. And so the married couple wouldn't go on a honeymoon. Instead, they would host a week-long open house. And it was their responsibility to provide the food and the wine. Of course, their family helped out. But in this particular case, Mary, Jesus' mother, noticed that the couple was about to run out of wine before they ran out of week. And in a hospitality culture like that one, that would have been a huge shame-based social faux pas. Not the way you want to get your marriage started. So Mary asks Jesus to intervene. Jesus goes off into a side room and he finds six big clay jars. These clay jars hold 20 gallons of water each. And so the water was uh, essentially for washing hands and washing feet. Now, just so you know, they didn't stick their hands in the water. They didn't stick their feet in the water. They would ladle it out to wash hands and wash feet. So there's 120 gallons of water, and Jesus transforms that 120 gallons of water 
into wine. And not just wine, but the best wine of the week. And Jesus was able through that miracle to keep the joy alive. Now John, interestingly, doesn't call this a miracle. He calls it a sign. Because these signs point us to Jesus. They say something about Jesus. In the Bible, wine is a sign for joy. And so by turning water into wine, Jesus was saying that he had come to start a revolution of joy. He'd come to bring an abundance of joy. And that with Jesus, there's more than enough joy to go around. You see, rather than being the leader of some dour, joyless religion, Jesus came to start this revolution of joy. He came to put the party back in their life, to put life back into the party. Over and over again, Jesus would tell stories about joy-filled parties. And he would use them as metaphors for what life looks like when God's grace breaks into our lives. Over and over again, Jesus would break into the lives of broken, hurting people and bring them joy by healing them, by forgiving them, by putting their lives back together. Whenever people encountered Jesus, joy broke out into their lives, and they were never the same. Now, this joy that Jesus gives is different from happiness, though it certainly includes happiness, it includes pleasure, it includes having fun, but it's deeper than that. Here's how author J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, says it. The surprise of joy is not escapist. It is not fugitive. It is miraculous grace. And then he goes on to say, it does not deny the existence of sorrow or failure. The possibility of those is necessary for joy to be the joy of deliverance. But it causes a person or child to catch his breath. It gives him a beat and a lifting of the heart as joy. You see, Jesus meets our lives with joy. And that joy fills us with hope. It fills us with grace so that we can look at life, all of life, with our eyes wide open. We can see it all. We can feel it all. But we do so through the perspective of hope and joy, knowing that Jesus is with us. Now, C.S. Lewis eventually went on to become a Christian. And when he first converted to Christianity, he said he was the most discouraged, uh, reluctant convert in all of England because he thought he had just given up his passport to joy. But then he was surprised by joy. And he was so surprised by it, he wrote a book called Surprised by Joy. Irma Bombeck went on to say this as she talked about that experience in church. She said, it occurred to me the entire world is in tears. And if you're not, then you'd better get with it. I wanted to grab this child with the the tear-stained face close to me and tell him about my God, the happy God, the smiling God, the God who had to have a sense of humor to have created the likes of us. Here was a woman sitting next to the only light left in our civilization, the only hope, our only miracle, our only promise of infinity. If he couldn't smile in church, where was there left to go? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And what that means is that through all of life, Jesus is there with you. His grace is there with you. And it's that grace, it's that joy that your strength. Because grace, joy is living in the promise that God will never leave you nor forsake you. That God is for you. That God loves you. That God is always there with you. And so Jesus wants to invite you today to join the revolution of joy. Joy is Jesus living in you. Joy is living by the promise that God is for you, that God does love you. And since that is true, Jesus says to you today, go bold and live joy. Amen.